myself. I think Doreen is trying to mute all of you. But if you're muted, please do not unmute yourself because we'll hear you talking uh, on phone <laughs> for sometimes we hear different uh, things in the background. So I hope we are all muted. That's right. So I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Frida Talangwe, and I'm the founder of ZD Circle. ZD Circle is an entrepreneurship and financing platform that is working um, mostly with uh, immigrant entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs in Africa. We do this because we feel sometimes there are a lot of um, entrepreneurs who are excluded from the mainstream um, structures, especially either uh, especially in financing and especially in, in the EU as well, every migrant or diaspora entrepreneur has to go through so much uh, difficulty in, in trying to access the financing that is available. So um, we do this as well with uh, combining uh, coaching and uh, capacity building programs, such as the ED4D program that we have uh, in partnership with IOM, because Ben will tell you later that um, just mere saying that you're doing fundraising doesn't help. You need to be investor ready, you need to have your house in order, you need to have a proper business model, your value proposition needs to be really uh, strong, um, and many other factors that we've covered um, before. So today I'm going to be your moderator, um, especially to the panelists, and I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. We have Ben White. Ben is the founder and CEO of VC for Africa. It's an entrepreneurship platform as well. That is, uh, I think he'll tell you, but they're also doing a lot of programs to, to assist the entrepreneurs locally, as well as fundraising efforts. Um, that will be our first speaker. And we also have um, Par, um, and Par is the uh, investment officer at uh, AHL Venture Capital. Um, they are based in Nairobi, but it's, uh, I think they are investing in a couple of um, African countries. We also have Kevin Kabat, uh, Kabatsik. Uh, the, forgive me for my turn, the name. Yeah, but um, Kevin is a program manager for Africa at Labo Bank. And uh, Labo Bank, as you all know, focuses on agri, uh, food and agri um, sectors, not just in the Netherlands, but uh, in emerging markets. And in Africa, especially, they are doing a lot with the entrepreneurs locally who are focusing on uh, food and agri. So without going too much into details, I'm going to welcome Doreen. Uh, Doreen Dekter is a program manager for diaspora at uh, IOM, Netherlands. And I welcome her to tell you more about uh, the AED4D program. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Frida, and uh, welcome to everyone today. This is our fourth session in a series of six. I hope mm -hmm. you're still not getting tired of us. <laughs> we have two more sessions to go after today. So as Frida said, my name is Doreen. For those who do not know me, I work at IOM, which is the International Organization for Migration. We are part of the UN and we have offices um, all over the world, but I'm based here in the Netherlands and we have different types of programs. One of them is um, programs aimed at uh, diaspora engagement. So we do a lot of uh, supporting diaspora who would like to transfer expertise to build up institutions in their countries of origin. Um, in this area, we have a lot of expertise. For entrepreneurship, it's a relatively new program. So we started this project called ED4D, Entrepreneurship by Diaspora for Development. We started it almost two years ago. It's a kind of pilot project uh, and we're focusing on Ghana and Ethiopia. Um, so we've selected actually a group of 20 from Ghana and 20 from Ethiopia who are residing in the Netherlands, but with business ambitions for Ghana and Ethiopia. Um, most of them are in a startup phase, but some are in a scale up phase. And the aim of the program is actually to, um, to offer different types of assistance in order to become um, let's say, uh, investor ready and prepared uh, before actually setting up the business. So we've done uh, entrepreneurial training together with Frida, a kind of boot camp for a couple of weeks. We also had um, individual mentorship, um, which was um, we try to match 
every single entrepreneur with a mentor from PUM, which is the Netherlands senior experts. And then um, we've selected um, a group of 10 for each country who are um, selected actually to go on a on an exploration trip to Ghana and Ethiopia, but due to the situation, we have to postpone it hopefully only until September. And this series of webinars is a little bit in the same spirit to uh, to offer actually um, an ID to all the entrepreneurs of different types of uh, programs, support programs that exist in order to become investor ready or even um, opportunities for access to finance. So we're inviting different speakers every week, and then we hope that it's useful for the entrepreneurs and that there's at least um, some opportunities that they would like to further explore. And then, of course, it's up to the entrepreneur to do something with this. So I'm very curious to listen to our three guests today. We're also recording this session. I don't know if you, uh, I think you were informed already by email. I hope you don't have any any problem with this. Uh, we're doing this for the people who cannot join live, but um, who are part of the program and who would like to listen to this um, presentation afterwards. So I give the floor back to uh, to Frida to introduce our first guest. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doreen, uh, for a wonderful introduction. Um, I think we're going to, to move to our, next, our first speaker. Uh, but before that, I would like to say that um, in about 20 minutes, then we'll have the Q&A session. And we prefer that you type in your questions on the chat. And um, I'll be able to read them out to Ben um, as, as we, I mean, at the end of it all. So don't feel pressured to try to talk. Just type anything that you want to say on the chat and I will um, uh, communicate. So, well. Time is up for Ben to, <laughs> to start. And um, as I said, Aria Ben is the CEO and founder of VCA for Africa. I am not going actually Ben to introduce you again. So I'll give you the floor to try and uh, introduce yourself and tell us more about VCA for Africa. Ben? Yeah, great. Uh, everyone can see this okay? Does this work? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'll try to to share uh, a few uh, insights. Uh, but then maybe in the questions and answers, uh, you can direct the conversation. Um, you know, to the topics that are the most relevant or the mo most pressing for you. Uh, and certainly from uh, our side, if if there's information. Uh, experience or, or context that are useful, uh, we're here uh, to share those uh, with you. Uh, but so it's uh, great to know that you're all uh, on the uh, entrepreneurial journey, uh, working to build the, the next great uh, African ventures. Uh, of course, we, let's see if I can get the slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, you are, uh, of course, entering in a very unique uh, period of time um, where, like it or not, there is a health uh, epidemic uh, well underway, um, still gaining momentum uh, across the globe, uh, also on the African continent, and where it's anyone's guess uh, how the next months and the next year will play out. What we do know is that there is already uh, an economic situation developing, uh, and this has uh, immense consequences for the uh, African venture ecosystem, uh, for the investment community, and for any entrepreneur uh, that is trying to build uh, a business in this environment. Um, we have quite a bit at stake, actually. Last year, 2019, uh, we for the first time as an industry, more than 1 billion US dollars was invested uh, into the early stage African ecosystem. Uh, this is more than 100 businesses that had fundraising rounds of a million or more. Uh, so we saw many companies being able to secure financial support of 10, 20, even 40 million US, which is uh, 
really unprecedented and something that has taken us a very long time uh, to grow and develop as a, uh, and, and to put you know, on the table as, a, as an industry. Um, but now we see, for example, many very well-known companies having to reposition themselves, uh, having to think uh, twice about uh, where they are spending the, the limited resources and the capital that they have. And unfortunately, also uh, having to relieve some of their staff. Uh, so some of the jobs that have been created by the industry are, are being lost um, at the moment. For uh, one entrepreneur's pain, it's of course another entrepreneur's opportunity. Uh, if you're looking for talent, uh, if you're looking for uh, business uh, developers, if you're looking for technical engineers or other um, personnel, in the countries where you're looking to expand your operations, uh, now would probably be a pretty good time uh, to put up a recruitment notice and to uh, to get some uh, some new people into your uh, into your project. Um, that said, we're looking at uh, kind of a, a recession across the continent for the remainder of 2020. Again, anyone's guess what happens in 2021, um, but there is uh, of course a big question: How do we respond as an industry? How do we respond as entrepreneurs? Um, and, and I think this is where you see now and what you will be seeing in the coming year is an increased emphasis on resiliency. What are the companies, what are the business models uh, that are designed to thrive in the current climate, in the current situation, whether it's uh, healthcare, fintech, education, other vital services, this is where the attention and the energy uh, is going to be is going to be spent. Um, we uh, work with uh, more than four thousand uh, Africa focused uh, early stage investors. Uh, Seventy five percent of them are saying, uh, you know, right now it is not business as usual. Um, what that means is that every investor has to assess what their exposure is. What that means is that they've probably already put money into companies. They need to understand um, what the next year looks like for those businesses, because most likely they're going to require additional money and support uh, if, if they're going to be able to you know, thrive and, sur and survive um, the current situation. Uh, that means that investors are um, a bit hesitant to look at new projects. Uh, because they don't want to necessarily get involved, you know, making new commitments if they're still trying to assess um, what what's already needed in terms of the portfolio that they manage. Um, we did see in Q1 of this year, however, uh, still very strong activity, uh, even more uh, robust than the same period last year. So we haven't seen a slowdown yet in the actual numbers. Um, but it's fair to expect in the, in the next two quarters, um, that could change a bit. Uh, this is just a, a quick indication of um, basically companies that have already secured funding uh, where 50% uh, uh, require financial support in the next 12 months. Um, that's, that's considered urgent in, in, in this ecosystem because fundraising takes a, a pretty uh, considerable uh, amount of time. Um, so, so basically, these are these are things that we have to understand as as entrepreneurs because this is the space um, in which we operate. And when we go and and try to find partners or we try to find investment, uh, we need to know what's going on in their heads and we need to know how they're being impacted. Uh, otherwise, uh, our pitches will land uh, kind of cold and and from left field, and and they're not going to get much of a response. So the more we understand the dynamics, um, the more we can position ourselves and, and, and the better we can manage um, you know, these conversations. This is what investors, so these are the investors that are you know, backing a lot of the companies that we read about online. Um, you know, they're, they're saying we've got an economic slowdown. At the same time, um, everything you know, digital is going to accelerate in terms of its adoption. So before, you know, it was kind of a, yes, we know it needs to happen. Yes, it's on our agenda of things to do. Um, now there's no discussion. 
uh, we have to digitize. Um, so wherever you are leveraging or using technology uh, in your business uh, and for the deployment of products or services, um, this uh, aspect of your business is going to become even more important and the adoption and, and the acceptance uh, most likely uh, is going to uh, accelerate. Uh, you have to look at basically uh, the funds that are in the market. We don't expect many new investors to come into the picture uh, in the coming months. When talking to an investor, it's important to know where they are in terms of the life cycle of their fund. You know, have they deployed all of their money or are they halfway through? Do they still have another five years um, to, to invest? In, in which case they've got cash and, and they do have to continue uh, allocating uh, monies. Um, so this is, you know, in, in terms of, of, you know, talking to partners and, and doing due diligence uh, on who they are. And uh, it's also important to know are uh, in terms of uh, their investment activities. Um, from the investor perspective, we're already seeing now uh, a pressure on valuations, right? Uh, risk uh, is uh, always a factor, uh, but now risk is even more difficult to assess. Uh, might also be the case that international investors are going to shy away uh, from the market for a bit, uh, which means that the uh, Africa active investors, um, you know, they hold the cards, so to speak. If if we can't get them to invest, then then who else are we going to go to? Uh, so so this will put a downward pressure on on valuations. Um, don't necessarily know if, if you should be bothered by that as a, as an entrepreneur, but we can, we can discuss it if you like, um, high net worth individuals, angel investors, um, they, of course, there's a lot of opportunities. So many of them will continue investing at the same time, angels and, and high net worth individuals. They need to know that there are investors downstream, uh, that will take up the 2nd, the 3rd. Uh, and the fourth round. Uh, so if if angels don't have that perspective, um, then they they're investing, but they don't know how many times they're going to have to come back to the table to help the entrepreneur before they can find other partners, bigger partners uh, that can take over uh, some of those responsibilities. Uh, so this is this is a concern uh, for a lot of the angels. Um, and then as always, investors are going to be focused on one. The team who's in the project, do they have the skills uh, and the tenacity to guide a project uh, in this market? Uh, and then uh, again, coming back to this point of resiliency, how purposeful is, is the innovation? Um, so anything that is not absolutely essential. So also you know, for African consumers who are conscious of what's in their wallet knowing that they can only spend on the things they absolutely need, your product and your service uh, has to fit into that basket. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's going to be uh, a very difficult, one, to sell it in the market, but two, uh, to find investors that are going to support it. Um, and yes, you're going to see now, again, uh, a separation between those that have money and cash on the bank uh, and those that, uh, that don't. Um, fundraising is going to take a little bit longer, so prepare. I think we always tell entrepreneurs, uh, you know, want to start building those networks from day one. Um, you know, uh, connect with people, uh, find a, a way to get them involved in your project uh, and keep them updated, right? Show people the progress that you're making over time. For example, I was at the first session for ZD. Um, you know, where uh, I got to see one of the first meetings that they were organizing and I've been able to follow the project over time where you can see um, the progress and the momentum and the things that they're doing. Uh, this really helps people connect to a, to a project or to an initiative uh, because it's not falling out of the sky. It's, it's something that they've been engaged with uh, and connected to for, for months after months. And, and that's what really helps in terms of, you know, building trust. Uh, and, and finding ways to, to connect people uh, to your mission. Um, on the ground due diligence is very difficult right now, right? So any investor or any partner, how are they going to know about, you know, the rest of your business? I mean, they can see your pitch deck, but they wanna know what's behind the pitch deck. 
Um, so it's, it's something to think about. Um, you know, the more information you are able to structure and the more available you make that information, uh, the easier it is for people to do their research uh, and to assess uh, uh, the business. Um, you could do a, a video tour of your physical operations. Uh, you could make videos. Um, you can do, you know, webinars, other things. But the more visibility you create for your operations, the more you can compensate for the fact that some people at this moment uh, are not able to travel or are not willing to travel uh, in order to do due diligence. Um, this is, uh, you know, just generally kind of where investors are concerned. Um, but uh, again, what you're what you're getting is an emphasis on the things that matter. So at a time uh, like this, it's going to be, uh, you know, your fintech space. It's going to be your uh, healthcare, your education, uh, agriculture, uh, access to, to, to food supply uh, and, and logistics. These are the areas that are essential for the workings of the economy where digital uh, has a big role to play. Uh, and where investors will be, I think, um, yeah, growing their uh, sort of, you know, their portfolios and where they where they will be focusing. Um, so these are a couple of, of examples of companies um, that are, you know, well positioned for the current situation. Whether it's Redburn in Ghana or Nawa Scientific in in Egypt, um, and you can find out about these companies on, online. I'm sure many of them are are household names. Uh, but so in combination to that resiliency, again, the only sort of determining factor we see in, in data about why some companies are successful or why some companies go on to raise more capital than other companies, uh, it comes down to the quality of the management team. So if you're a single founder, that's, that's a kind of a red flag, right? Um, you want to see two or three people with complementary skill sets uh, that are coming together to form a, a professional management team um, where, you know, all of sort of the key uh, areas that the business uh, requires to operate successfully are covered, whether, you know, it's having that financial uh, expertise and discipline, uh, managerial expertise. If you're in agriculture, you have to have that agricultural expertise. If you don't have these qualities in your management team, you need to be thinking about who you can partner with uh, or how you can get mentors or coaches or other advisors involved uh, in trying to fill out the rest of your, your deck. Um, because at the end of the day, it's the team of people uh, that is the single greatest point of, of qualification. Um, don't know if we want to go too much into this. Maybe we can touch on it again uh, in the Q and A. Uh, but just to know that uh, you know every investor has a different focus and where they're trying to put their money. And at this moment, they have very specific uh, challenges and constraints in how they can make decisions. So you have to, you know, it's not a, a homogeneous bucket. It's not a single investor. Um, you know, that we can lump as a single entity. Uh, it's a very diverse ecosystem and the investment space is also very diverse. And each investor, we have to understand who they are, their position in the market uh, and how they're being impacted. Um, through the VC for a network, there are at least more than 250 uh, institutional uh, investment firms. Um, you can also see here a listing. These slides are available, so you can check this stuff out later. Um, there's also a, a listing of um, sort of resources that are coming online that are specific to COVID-19, if that's something that you want to explore. Uh, we also have a marketplace um, on the, the VC4A website where you can find other, you know, programs, uh, opportunities, hackathons. Uh, other incubation or acceleration offerings uh, that could be useful for you in terms of connecting to a marketplace, connecting to expertise, uh, further developing your product or, or your service. Um, why you would maybe join VC for A, it's one, we can help with visibility uh, for what you're doing, help people discover you. A lot of people, we have uh, membership in 160 countries where people are using the platform as a tool to uh, find projects, to find entrepreneurs. Uh, so it's a discovery tool. 
You can also register your fundraising needs, which are made available to the investment network. Uh, if they think it's interesting for a call or to connect with you directly, um, there's more than 2,000 programs, events, uh, challenges, other opportunities um, that are uh, at your access. Um, there's a mentorship program. There's also an academy with a lot of materials on a lot of the key issues that we face as founders. Like, for example, how to you know navigate a term sheet, how to structure an agreement with a co-founder, uh, very practical things like this. So also templates, how-to guides, uh, and other resources uh, that you can use. Um, and then through the VC for A website, you can of course also uh, fundraise um, by explaining. Uh, you know, who you are, your track record, what you've accomplished, uh, and what you are trying to achieve uh, in your next steps. Membership to VC for A is free of charge. Um, there, we don't, uh, we're not involved in matchmaking. So we uh, trust that you will do due diligence on the people that you meet. Um, we don't necessarily need to know about it or be involved. We're not looking for a success fee. We don't take equity. Uh, we don't invest. We are only building a piece of infrastructure, a networking technology that helps to make uh, an industry more visible and thereby more accessible. Um, and uh, we are able to get our support uh, through uh, the many different programs and initiatives uh, that we run uh, as an organization. For example, we do an annual investor conference. We do uh, research on the industry. Uh, we also uh, this morning launched something called the Venture Showcase. This year is in partnership uh, with Amazon. Uh, and so there's many other ways that we find partners and, and support, um, you know, in order to do the work uh, that we do, uh, but, but still making all of the resources, the network and the infrastructure available to entrepreneurs uh, free of charge. Um, you're joining a network with about 135,000 uh, founders uh, who are active from across the continent. And again, many from the diaspora uh, with uh, uh, membership in 160 countries. We could go together tomorrow to Tokyo and uh, we could have drinks with VC for A members uh, in Japan. So uh, I don't want to uh, go much further because uh, the time is yours. And uh, I think uh, the, the three speakers that we have today uh, all have a lot of uh, expertise and, and information, um, and, and we want to make sure that we answer. Um, hello, can you hear me? <laughs> I, I lost Ben in the last uh, uh, part, but thank you very much, Ben. Um, I think you're done with the presentation. Yes. Hello? I can't. Hello. I think he can still hear you. Eh? So maybe we can just, uh, maybe you can read out one of the, or some of the questions that were being asked. Yes. Um, I think I lost Ben in the last bit. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> That's how I was trying to wonder what's going on. But um, the first question is, uh, what would you, what would be required to join the VC for a platform? I think you already said it's free, but if you have anything else to add, Ben? Hello? What's going on? Doreen? Yes, I think he's uh, he's having some uh, technological problem. Ah, okay, but you can hear me because I... yes, yes, I think it's just Ben. I think everybody can hear you. Yeah. But um, of course, one of the questions also was if we would share this presentation, which we will surely do. You will also have Ben Ben's contact, so um, yeah, I think we can get in touch with him if he's not coming back. Mm -hmm. um, I think what he said, I mean, he said that the, you can just register on the platform and explain your startup. Yes. up and um, I've, 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 I've already registered there. So it's not difficult to do that. Um, the other question is, would you inform us what the source of information are to conclude that there are lack of investment interest in the coming months for us not 
good news. Of course, it's very disappointing, um, but I would, uh, now I'm gonna talk <laughs> from my own experience. I think there are different investors looking for different um, investment opportunities. Some are really resilient. For example, if um, you already have some investors in your network who knew what you were going to do back in your country of origin, in Africa or even here in Europe, uh, already that kind of investor knows that um, being um, them not being um, of African descent or even having lived in Africa, they expect some specific challenges that um, are in that market. Of course, there are those investors that really get shocked with all the COVID and everything. Some really uh, come off and you know say, "Well, I'm gonna wait for COVID." But there are other type of investors, of course, that are willing to take a little bit more risk. But Ben, maybe I can see you to go back to the questions. Um, I was answering your question. I think I can see Ben. Ben, can you hear me? No, he cannot. Let me check for another question. Mm. Um, the other question was, uh, what is the guarantee to get investors for your business if you join the VC4A? I think there are no guarantees here. I'm sorry <laughs> to say on behalf of Ben, I can say that. But I think I heard him say that um, there's visibility so your startup gets visibility from investors or even other startups you identify peers who are doing um the same kind of products in your in your in your sector or even the same um maybe they have in innovation that you're not using so i think it's interactive um and i do not think there are any sort of guarantees but I, i'll direct that question to ben ben are you there Hello, Ben. If you're not there still, we can proceed. Um, oh, yeah, he says he, do, he doesn't have audio. I'll ask him to type in the questions and maybe uh, the answers to the questions, and we can maybe proceed because, um, yeah. Um, actually, there are no more questions to that, but for me, the takeaways were, of course, it's really uh, disheartening to hear that, you know, the the African market is not going to be uh, one of the best to go to, but I think it's universal. COVID has just crushed every market that there are. I think what we are seeing mostly is the resilience. So if, for example, the Netherlands or uh, countries in Europe have better programs for entrepreneurs, so probably those entrepreneurs will come up more quickly than, for example, in another country where there are no proper um, uh, programs for the entrepreneurs. So I would say do not give uh, Ruth hope because of COVID, especially now that you can't travel, make sure that you have all the structures that you need um, for, for, your, for your company, you know, come up with the right strategies, um, come up with the right team, reach out to the people on the ground especially, uh, make sure that you have the, all the information that investors ask for, like um, in due diligence, because even if you go and um, you go to a bank, for example, they'll require some kind of history, some kind of information package. So I really encourage you to take this time. Uh, I'm also doing that because we are not up and down a lot, to make, I mean, to, to do like some housekeeping. Um, try to really scan, see what you really need. Uh, say if COVID lockdown is over, what, what's the first thing that I'm gonna do uh, for my business? So I think that's that's um, the best strategy. Um, and of course, I would encourage all of us to think about how to make our business models more innovative. Um, the truth is, no matter what sector you're in, technology is going to be the most important from now on till uh, the end of time yeah and all the businesses are investing something extra for their businesses to be more uh, tech savvy i would say there are so many tools out there that can help your business um that are free for example wordpress has um 
very friendly um, uh, packages for starting entrepreneurs. And even sometimes you can use a free application just to showcase your business, have a website, you know, show what products you have. Even if it's a farm, people are going to start looking for you online, you know. Um, and of course, trying to make things like logistics. So if you need to uh, distribute your products, uh, try to think of technology, uh, I mean, in doing this. So I think I'm going, I'm not going to talk much. Um, I'll ask Ben to, I, I know he was supposed to learn to other programs um, at four, but I asked Doreen to write to him. That's the same reason I'm not able to type as I talk, to so just ask him to, I mean, if he has specific uh, answers to the questions that are listed, he can always type on the chat and I can read them all um, at the end of the uh, program. So we are going to move to the next um, presenter. I think actually we're in good time. It's 5.36. Um, and we're going to move to Pierre Pal Nyaosi. She's an investment officer at uh, AHL Venture Partners. It's a, a venture capital um, fund in, in, in Africa. It's based in Nairobi. They have, I think they are regionally. They are in Ghana. They are also, or their partners are in Ghana. Um, they are in most East African countries. But I think I do not want to confuse you with <laughs> what they're exactly trying to do. So Par, I'll, I'll give you the, the stage. I can see your presentation. Um, and we need to, yeah, to see one page and slide. Um, yes, it's very clear, Pal. Then go ahead, thank you. Um, thank you, Frida and Doreen. I hope you can all hear me. And I hope you can also see my screen. So thank you for organizing these webinars and thank you to the participants as well. Thanks, Ben, for the good background you've given us. I think it's covered a lot on the investment landscape at the moment uh, in light of COVID-19 and given us all a few tips, whether we're investors or entrepreneurs. So thank you for that. Um, so now I just want to move on to my presentation. Um, so my name is Palnya Osi from AHL Venture Partners. And um, on the screen is actually one of our in portfolio investments in Ethiopia called Ethio Chicken, and I'm very proud of it. So I decided to have it as our cover page. And let me just move on to the agenda. So just to show you what we'll cover today, just introduction to what AHL is, who we are, what our investment strategy is, what our DD process is, and then other resources that I think will be useful for all of us. So to begin with, who is AHL Venture Partners? So we are one of the first impact focused uh, VCs in Africa. We were established in 2007 to commemorate the life of our patron who was a visionary Swedish entrepreneur and business leader uh, who goes by the name Adolf Lundin. And he really believed that what we need to do is to give people hand ups and not handouts in order to alleviate poverty. And that's why AHL was set up in those early years. Um, our vision as AHL is that all Africans will benefit from um, a thriving and inclusive local economy. And how we intend to do that really is through investing in innovative, scalable businesses, in energy access, in financial inclusion, and also in food security, so that we can have both a positive um, impact on the environment, as well as financially. Um, so that's what AHL's mission and vision is. On the screen, you can see other details about us. So basically, through our investments, we've been able to cover a majority of countries in Africa um, through both our direct and indirect investments. Um, the second thing you can see is the, is, the, is the sectors we invest in, which I've already mentioned. And we try to really uh, focus on the SDGs and align our impact to the SDGs, as you can see. The third thing is the asset classes. So how do we invest? We do we do pretty much everything, debt, equity, funds, and even earlier on, we did a lot of convertible notes and even a few grants. Well, some of these we no longer do, but we have pretty much done the whole landscape. You can also see the kind of ticket sizes that we've typically done. In terms of our structure, because every fund has a different structure, we have what we call a permanent capital vehicle, which means that um, basically we, can be able to provide very patient capital, be in your business for a much longer time um, than other funds. 
we are also backed by a high net worth individual. So I'll move on to the next slide where I thought it would be good to show you um, some of our portfolio companies that we've invested in across the three sectors. I hope you can recognize at least one or two in your countries. There's Ethiopia Chicken for the people from Ethiopia, and then we have People's Pension Trust, um, which is in Ghana. But overall, we've invested all over Africa. I just wanted to highlight one of our companies, which is Twiga, uh, which you may or may not know, but it's actually a big name um, in Africa and in Kenya, especially. Um, they're in the logistics space, and especially with to do with food, um, rather fruit and vegetables. And especially in this COVID time, they really benefited from what's happening. Um, even as Ben mentioned earlier on, that one person's pain could be another person's um, um, opportunity. And why I wanted to highlight Trigger is because last year they had a very large equity round of about $30 million. And they were able to get IFC and Goldman Sachs uh, to be the lead investors. And this is a company that uh, just started the other day, about maybe five, six years ago. We were one of the early investors with an investment of less than a million dollars. And in just four or five years, the company has grown and is able to attract external investments. Um, so yeah, that's just some of the investments we've made. I think I can move on to our next slide where I want us to understand what our investment strategy is as AHL. So the first thing, um, we are very fast and flexible because we are not like the big DFIs who have really rigid standards that they need to follow and processes. And so this enables us to be able to curate solutions and uh, come up with very innovative, um, innovative funding structures for entrepreneurs. And also we do a lot of co-investing, which means we look out for other investors who are aligned with us and we come into a deal with them, which makes it easy for all of us. We also do a lot of following investments. So we may start small with 500K or even less and then continue to build as time goes by because we are with our entrepreneurs along their journey. Um, in terms of the criteria, I've put three key points there. These are very general, but of course it depends on the particular product that you're looking at. So sector and geography, there has to be impact um, that we define that has to be um, a path to scale or profitability. These have to be very clear to us. And in terms of the products, I've outlined the three major ones right now, although there's a fourth one, which is funds. We also invest in other funds that then invest in uh, companies. So there's equity, which is like between seed and uh, series A rounds. We take in a minority stake. We don't take majority. We just come in as to minority. And then there's working capital, where the major criteria there is that um, you need to be at least EBITDA positive to show that you can repay a loan. And then the last one is actually very exciting for me, the bridge financing, which is very high on our priority right now. And it's something that we just piloted in the last nine months. Um, and the idea here basically is where a company has a significant um, liquidity event and they need a bridge to that. So for example, you're raising capital or you're just about to sell your assets or there's an off taker agreement that you need to take advantage of. But in the meantime, you need funding um, to take you through that. So we as AHL can come in, give you the funds for that period. It could be like a six month period or even longer, as long as it can be assured that once the liquidity event materializes, we will get our repayment. So that's one that's very um, interesting for us at the moment. And I thought I shouldn't end this slide without telling you what else we bring to the table apart from just the capital that we provide. And so I've, I've listed about four areas there on the screen, starting with strategy. We can help you um, do a bit of strategic positioning. Say, where does this company want to go in the next five years? Um, what partnerships can we create? Or how can we basically um, um, pivot the company? And we can also see if there are synergies within our own portfolio. Um, so let's say one company in our portfolio, how can it work with another port portfolio company of ours? And we've seen that work very well. Another area is finance. So this involves helping you with capital raising once you're already a portfolio company, because we know that there'll, there'll be many more rounds of financing that come and we're able to help you with that and just to be able to be ready for the next investors. On the people side, which is exciting also, we can help you with recruitment. Um, we can help you with recruitment, we can be on your remuneration committees. And lastly, on governance, we are very involved within the board level, where we help with recruitment to the board, we help your board become more engaged. And also the issue of ESG, how this is being, um, how this is being rolled out within the company, 
and also gender diversity, which is actually very exciting. Uh, how diverse is your board? How diverse is your senior management team, for example? So I'll move on to our DD process. So I thought that I should just give you an overview of our overall investment process and to show you that the DD is right in the middle of it, but then there are other processes that come in before and after. So the first one is pipeline. This is where we meet a company for the first time. It could be physically or, uh, or online or through um, other conferences or through referrals. And then we exchange information um, at that point in time um, after signing an NDA, of course. And then we move on to our first IC where we as AHL present it to our investment committee. And if they give us a uh, clearance uh, in, in principle, we move on to the due diligence phase. If that goes well, we move on to the second IC where if it's approved, then we move on to the last stage, which is legals and disbursement. And this process could take, you know, it could take a, a bit of time depending on uh, depending on the products that we're looking at. So I wanted us to dive into the due diligence process. What does it actually take? So basically it takes number one, a review of your data room, basically all your documentation that you have put together for us as investors. And what we advise is that you need to anticipate what uh, what we will need and begin to line up that information. I think Frida has mentioned something to do with that. And this is like a very good time to be doing that. And that advantage of that is that it will make the whole DD process very smooth and it will avoid uh, what we call transaction fatigue because this process can take a very long time. But if everything is already in order, it will take uh, a much shorter time. So that's number one. And how you can do that is uh, something a vendor due diligence you could contact one of the financial advisors and they could help you prepare for that in that way secondly is the field work well maybe in this particular environment it's a bit um difficult for us to actually um physically visit um the sites the premises the customers the suppliers but this is always going to be an important part of our dd process as uh, i think as frida and ben mentioned you can do the videos for now and when we are able to travel we will surely come and visit your premises because we need to see what is actually happening on the ground apart from that we will meet with the team so both uh senior management and also the other employees just to understand how the processes um flow then last but not least we have the investment memorandum which is an internal um, document that we populate once we've done all our due diligence and so on the right you can just see a few key areas are pointed out what exactly we're looking for of course there are many more areas these are just the key ones. So there's the business model. Um, what's your product? What's your process? What are the operations? And where in the value chain are you exactly? I need to understand. Are you a distributor or are you a producer? Because sometimes it's not very clear. Um, then the market and competition, do you have a competitive advantage? On financial performance, we need to look at both uh, the historical and the projected numbers, as well as the unit economics. If we just take per customer, what's the profit and what's, or what's the loss? Um, on a per customer basis, for example. An important thing I can mention here under financial performance is that uh, because a lot of time ent entrepreneurs really focus on the revenue line and they just want to show us how the revenue line will grow exponentially. Uh, but don't forget the cost line. Remember that the costs are easier for you to control um, than the revenue. So be very careful about the costs. Try to cut costs as much as you can. Um, then there is the impact ESG and gender. We are a gender smart investor, so we try to invest in in companies that actually are either led by women or benefit women or involve women a lot, even in the supply chain. Then under risk and mitigation, um, there's many risks. Every business has a risk or has risks. What we need to do is just identify the level and be able to see if we can mitigate it as much as possible. The other factors which I haven't mentioned here, for example, macro, uh, to do with the, com the country where the, the investment is, um, is located, what's happening in the political scene and in, in the economic scene. All of these factors are very important for us. So I hope I haven't rushed through my <laughs> presentation because it seems like I'm almost done. Um, so here I just wanted to give us really some general tips, uh, what you can begin doing even now as you prepare to meet investors and to grow your business, as you continue growing your business. So the first point is start documenting the processes from day one. I think everyone has talked on that. It's so much easier 
um, if you start right away rather than wait for the time when you actually need to do that. Number two is a clear articulation of the problem and the solution. And this is important because many times uh, we find ourselves as investors, we don't even understand what the business is doing because it hasn't been explained in a way that is simple and clear. Don't complicate it, just make it very easy for us to understand. Number two is know what type of capital you need. Do you need equity? Do you need debt? And uh, why do you need why do you need it? You need to be very clear. If it's, uh, let's say if it's 100K that you need, uh, how much is going, let's say for stuff, how much is for technology, break it down to the very granular bit as much as possible. Next is make sure you perform a due diligence on investors. So it's not only us, the investors, who need to perform a due diligence on you, you also need to perform that on, on, on us. And this is important because investors come in different shapes and forms and sizes. Um, they have different philosophies, um, you know, different cultural contexts, different return expectations, different reputations in the market. You also need to find out what is this investor known for in the market? Are they one who will just leave you hanging um, on the negotiation table or when things, you know, things are thick during this COVID time, will they abandon me? So you need to understand all of this as well as understand what they bring um, above and beyond um, finance. Are there some networks that they can introduce you to? Are there some, is there some technical expertise um, that they can give you that you need? Because it's not all about money. It's much more than money. So need, you need to understand this. And once you understand that, um, make sure you get, you identify one of them to be a lead investor. And the importance of this is a lead investor will help you to mobilize other investors and also help you to close the deal quicker. Because you know, time is of the essence. This fundraising process can take years, I mean, months or sometimes even years. So just shorten the process, have one who is very aligned to what you're looking for and let them lead the process. And then the second last point is on transparency and trust. There needs to be transparency and trust between the parties, between the entrepreneurs and the investors. If that is not there, things are gonna fall apart pretty soon. And also we as investors do not like surprises for example if you have a litigation process right now maybe there's an employee who is um who has sued you and you have a court process in process right now you need to tell us or maybe you have a huge debt somewhere uh, that you haven't um, revealed within the financials you need to do that because when we find out we won't be very happy uh, <laughs> as you can imagine and then last but not least you need to get the right advice um financial legal and otherwise don't walk alone in this journey of entrepreneurship. There are things that you know, maybe based on your expertise, but there are many other things that you may not be aware of. So make sure you get the right stuff, get the right advice. So on my last slide, this is actually my last slide. I just came up with a few resources that I thought would be very useful for you um, from incubators, accelerators, angel networks, financial advisors, and even investor conferences that I think would be very useful for you on your journey tried to put as much as I could from, you know, like from, from Ghana and Ethiopia, there's Ice Addis on the top and Blue Moon from Ethiopia. We also have uh, Renew is in Ethiopia. Then from Ghana, I put the Ghana Angel Investor Network, there's Kumasi Hive. Um, and then there are also the financial advisors. So we have Open Capital and Parity and Cross Boundary, which we've worked with ourselves as AHL which I think is very, very, very important to just help you organize your information, make sure you network as much as possible. We here in East Africa, we have the East Africa Venture Capital Association that organizes a lot of um, 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 conferences. Right now they're doing them more online. Um, so my message to you is just get out there, network as much as possible um, so that you get um, the best information. So I think I'm done with my presentation. I hope I didn't rush through it, <laughs> but I'm happy to um, answer any questions that would follow from this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. I think I really enjoyed your presentation as well as you touched on from an investor's point of view, uh, because you guys invest, so you are a typical investor. So it's good for us to really hear from the horse's mouth. I'm really happy with the story of uh, Twigger. Because in 2015, actually, I helped, yeah. I was helping Twiga through another company I was working for, Get Working Capital. Like they started from nothing and they didn't have any, they didn't have any special um, 
backing from anywhere and now you can hear their success is uh, really good and maybe in connection with that um somebody asked uh what's um uh, what, what is the good lesson you learned from the success of trigger that's the first question par oh okay the yeah. lesson the good lesson we've learned from the success of trigger, trigger. I think Trigger, first of all, was coming in to really formalize um, the agriculture, the food and agriculture logistics network. So that was something that really hadn't been done before in the manner in which they were doing it. So basically what they do is they connect the small scale farmer in the rural areas, people who are farming bananas, oranges, etc. And then they connect them to the vendor in the city. So the guys on the streets who are selling um, the same kind of fruit and vegetable. And they do this through a mobile app um, that they were able to connect the two. So I think what they did was very innovative, just trying to cut out these middlemen who are in the middle. Um, so one thing you can learn from that is to try create efficiencies um, where there's a lot of inefficiencies in the, in the market right now, especially in Africa, you can, there are so many opportunities for you to do that. So if you can find an opportunity that does that, please do as much as you can. Of course, with technology, it's going to be initially expensive, but then it's going to be transformative. It's going to be resilient. Like right now with COVID-19, they're doing very well because as an essential service, they're able to actually, um, they're able to continue surviving and get more volumes. Another thing is because they were very um, good at networking with um, and getting the right investors on board, the investors on board have been able to get better investors for them as time went by. And just being very transparent uh, with the investors, what's happening uh, in terms of their financials and their key goals every month. That's something that's very important. Don't don't um, don't hide what is happening. I mean, it took them a long time to even get to break even, um, but that did not worry them as long as they were on the right track and they were doing the right things for them to grow their business. Thank you very much. I can see Ben is about to leave at four. So his question is, how do you look at governance and uh, quality of management systems? What are the things you see entrepreneurs overlooking or underestimating time and time again? Yeah, so for governance, I think, as I mentioned before, there's a number of areas we look at. There's starting with ESG, so environmental, social, and governance, and how we do that as AHL we have come up with certain screens where we have questions that we subject our prospective investment to uh, and just run the questions through. And actually these ESG screens are also embedded with gender screens. So we also check what's the number of women uh, within the various departments and how, how involved are they? So that's one that's on the ESG. Another thing under governance, we look at the board in terms of both um, gender diversity, as I mentioned before, but then also how balanced and how diverse is it? Um, do we have people of different uh, expertise within the board? If not, we can also help uh, later on to be able to improve that. Also on the governance side, we can look at um, things like, um, sorry, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm um so that's how we look at uh the governance i think the main thing is the esg screen because our esg screens are quite quite uh comprehensive and they have very detailed questions on each we also look at anti-bribery for example and corruption uh do they have a policy for that do they have um, a hr policy all these kind of policies are they in place and if not can we quickly come up with them then on the quality of management uh of quality of management systems i don't know if he means the team itself or he means like financial management systems. For if it's actually the IT systems, we would try to get someone who's an expert to help us with that because we're not very, uh, we don't have the internal capacity to do that. But if it means the team, what we're looking at for the team is a team that is able to execute the vision. They can show passion for the idea and uh, to stick to the vision. And also they have the necessary expertise to be able to run the company. Some of the things that entrepreneurs are overlooking and underestimating time and time again, I think costs, which I mentioned in my presentation, people tend to focus so much on revenue. You see revenue, you can't really control. Of course, you, 
you think of all the marketing and sales that you can do to increase your customers, but that's not guaranteed. It could fail miserably. What is more uh, controllable by you is actually the cost side. Uh, so you need to ensure that um, obviously the you're not spending too much uh, expenditure on the wrong things or your salaries, salaries are not inflated. It's not really a lifestyle business. Just try to keep costs as low as possible. And I think that will, that will be very helpful. Thank you, Pa. The next question is, um, if you establish in Ghana and um, how easy is it uh, to go through the process of? Yes, so for Ghana, we actually have, um, I believe two direct investments in Ghana itself. Though in West Africa, through our fund investments, we have an additional number. So in Ghana, we have uh, People's Pension Trust, which I mentioned earlier on, and another one called ESOCO, which provides uh, information on market prices. So that's as far as our, our establishments in Ghana are. And we are quite active in that market. We used to have an office actually in West Africa. Uh, unfortunately, we closed it uh, sometime last year, but that hasn't stopped us from being active in the market. We still make trips to Ghana. The last um, trip was actually in January by some of my team members. So we have our roots there as well as through the funds that we invested in. For example, there's one called Injaro in West Africa and ANP. So our roots are still quite deep in Ghana. You are able to reach us through, through the contacts that are provided. Okay, and um, you only focus, somebody's asking if you only focus on the three SDG goals, right? No. Okay, so in my presentation, I only took the three that are directly aligned to the particular sectors, but there's actually quite a number that we look at. So like SDG 1, which is uh, no poverty, and then SDG 2, which is zero hunger. We also look at uh, SDG 7, um, affordable and clean energy, SDG 8, decent and economic work growth, and also SDG 5, which is about uh, gender equality and many others. So on that slide, I only put the three that were directly linked. Mm -hmm. There's actually quite a number that we Okay, look thank at. you. I think somebody else is asking too, in fact, asking what, I, what you charge for the service. But of course, um, they are not, they are not, for example, in consultancy, but I think they are providing FADI. Maybe the right, the right question would be, um in your products um what's the return how much you know if they are loans how much interest things like those maybe yeah you're right so we don't charge the only thing we charge is if we're giving you a loan and uh at the moment uh we don't have a standard figure because it all depends on the level of risk the way we assess it right but what I would say is that we would charge at least 10% uh, on the dollar for now. We're only doing dollar loans. We've done some local currency loans before, but now we're only doing dollar loans. So I hope that, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, what's the minimum amount your company gives and what is the repayment time? So the minimum is uh, $500,000 at the moment. So depending on the product, as I mentioned, if it's the bridge loan that you need, the minimum is six months, um, but that can go up to two years. And then, and then if it's a working capital facility where it can be renewed every year, it can go up to four years or a term loan, yeah. Um, okay. Um... Yeah, I think they asked again about the interest rates, but I think that's what you, uh will be able to give you when you follow up with her later because it depends on the product and uh, the time and all that. I think that's what she said. Uh, ben said, thank you, Paul. Nice presentation. Look forward to connecting with you again soon. He had thank to you. go. I think Ben is not here with us, but he's going to hear the compliments. I'm also really happy. And the other question, I think we are about to finish now because we are learning late. Uh, uh, thank you, Pa, for the presentation. Please, does that does you do you actually have to be a scale up to have access to your organization? Okay, that's that's a good question because uh, over the last four years we've kind of shifted our strategy a bit. 
we have done very early stage companies, uh, even seed or even pre-seed before. But currently we've kind of paused on that. So especially on the equity side for yeah. the next uh, maybe 18 months or so. Um, so for now, we would really focus on companies that are able to repay us, for example, if it's the, if it's the bridge loan or the term loan, yeah. just for now. But in yeah. the next few years, we could actually go back to early stage investing. So what my advice would be is uh, just keep in contact with us because what we believe is that we need to start the, the journey early with you, start the partnership early, like right now, even if you might not even be in a scale up phase, if you can keep us updated uh, with your progress and we continue to build the relationship and then at the right time we would invest. I mean, some of our companies, we started talking to them even two years ago and then we start, we just invested the other day. So it doesn't hurt to always get in touch with the right investors even if it's a bit early, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul. I think we all agree that uh, both Ben and Paul really did a nice presentation and thank you for your time. I think it was uh, crystal clear. We are going to share with um, the participants, um, you know, the presentation and your private okay. details as well, so they can reach yeah. out to you. I know <laughs> most of your colleagues are here. Thank you very much for the nice work that you're doing. Uh, but Thank now, you. because of time, I'll ask you to, if you have other questions for Pal, on the chat, you can actually send a message to our directory. Or you can ask it generally and she can type the answers as we speak. So I'm going to introduce uh, Kevin. Kevin, are you there with us, Kabatsi? I am there. I am here. Yes, yes. Kevin is the program manager for Africa at uh, Rabo Foundation. I already, yes. already said they focus on food and agri, but I'll give him the floor to really take us to um, what he has for us. Kevin? Yes. All righty. Let's go to the slideshow. Yes. It's clear, right? Yes. Everybody yes. can see? Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really a big honor to be speaking to all of you today. Um, so I'm at the Rabo Foundation as a program manager for Africa, more specifically Central and West Africa. Ethiopia is also in my portfolio and my colleague who couldn't make it today, her name is Madlon. She handles most of East Africa, so that includes Tanzania, Kenya, uh, Uganda, uh, where we actually have most of our projects, but we are fairly widespread across the continent. Yes, how do I? Yeah, there we go. So Rabu Foundation uh, has been in existence for quite some time now, since 1974, at least in Africa, but globally, it's been quite a bit older. Um, basically, the way Rabu Foundation works, Rabu Foundation is the foundation arm, the social lender arm of the Rabu Bank Group. So for those of you who are not familiar, Rabu Bank um, is the biggest agricultural bank in the world, and it's based in the Netherlands. We unofficially have the title of the Global Agricultural Bank, Food and Agri. Um, and the way it works is globally, we have our wholesale and retail offices where we deal with the much, much bigger clients. And this is our corporate and, and our commercial side of the bank. The foundation is a separate arm. So we recognize at the foundation that the type of ticket sizes that the Rabo Bank was trying to reach globally we're missing out a lot of the smallholder farmers in Africa and a lot of the small and medium enterprises in Africa. So we started the Rabo Foundation. We have the objective, not just the Rabo Foundation, but also the Rabo Bank Group, to be um, to help feed the growing populations in the world. The idea that we're growing a better world together, and the Rabo Foundation is critical for this. So in Africa, we're based in eight countries. Um, in, the, in West Africa, it's Senegal, Ivory Coast, and Ghana. We're also in Rwanda. We have a lot of work in Rwanda and also uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Uganda. Um, we have a regional office, which is in Nairobi. I myself am based in the Netherlands, in Utrecht. Um, and I would very frequently travel to Africa. That's obviously not that possible right now with, uh, with COVID. Um, so we're hoping, I think like some of you, um, if I remember the introduction to this program, are also hoping to travel back to Africa soon. The team who's visiting Ghana and Ethiopia, um, those will also be countries on my list. Um, and 
based on my on my experience, um, if I speak specifically of, of Ghana and Ethiopia and maybe some of the other countries, it's really um, a widespread capacity uh, or uh, or appetite for foreign investment. Um, for example, I think Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, are, Kenya and Uganda specifically are quite welcoming to uh, to foreign investors with uh, pretty good uh, exit strategies, and people are able to take funds out of the country. Um, but with Ethiopia, it's it's quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge because, like I mentioned, we focus specifically on food and agri-related SMEs, and so we usually are, you know. We, we invest with an SME, it's social lending, so we, we um, are very uh, friendly with our terms. We don't collateralize any, um, any um, securities, any properties. Um, but the whole idea is that we're focused on the impact. Um, I'm, 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 I'll explain the impact a little bit. But just an idea of the type of value chains that we're involved in, I wrote it down over here if you'd like to see. Uh, coffee, dairy, horticulture, nuts, grains, um, really across the spectrum, uh, fish. Uh, and if you can see here in this graph, there's you can see the growth. Um, these are the, not the most recent figures. I think we're now at about 150 different projects um, in Africa. Um, and yeah, annually we, we invest yeah, 10 to 11 million euros each year. So we have quite a big scope uh, and capacity. Um, so this is a little bit our strategy. I thought it was important to share is because we're not uh, commercial, we're not a, a capitalist or a private equity type of fund. Uh, we really focus on impact and we we measure our success not in the returns um, of money, but in the returns of uh, the impact. So the impact can be measured by the environmental impact. Um, you know things like crop rotation, reforestation. Uh, making sure that people are um, that the different uh, SMEs are doing something to making our environment more sustainable. Social impact: we have really key social indicators on gender, on youth, um, you know, on refugees, different types of social indicators that we that we manage. And of course, we in the end, our goal is to have our our end end client or our end target group are the smallholder farmers. So through an SME, if they're able to develop an uh, innovative and useful enough um, solution that benefits the smallholder farmers on the other side, then you know we're cooking with gas. Um, and what we use usually is our network, of course, our financing and our innovation. So um, we have a really, truly vast network being part of the Rabobank group um, globally when it comes to food and agri. Uh, whether you want someone who wants to, for example, we have people who want to export uh, sesame seeds uh, or cocoa beans or uh, coffee beans, um, we have the access to, to buyers and we can make those types of links. We have really strong network. In terms of knowledge, we have really strong knowledge within the bank that we then filter through the foundation. And of course, um, innovation and financing, that's, uh, that's a no-brainer. We do lend out money. Um, and this is a rough idea, a rough sketch of the type of impact we like to have. We'd like to partner because we don't even really call our clients partners. We call them our partners. Um, we don't call them clients, we call them partners. And that's, and that's because we're not, we're not in this business specific to the foundation. We're not in this business to make money. We're in this business to improve the capacity of smallholder farmers globally. Um, right now, I am speaking about our capacity within Africa. To show you an example of some of, of our success cases, I just realized by chance that these are all from Kenya, but we have success cases from around the, the continent. Um, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Musoni or AgriWallet or Apollo, but these are three solutions based out of Kenya that are food and agri tech solutions. Um, the first one, um, it's it's a it was, it's a solution Musoni that was that was um, designed by actually someone based in the Netherlands who eventually had moved back to Kenya um, and started the business there, and it basically is a system that microfinance institutions can use um, that he licenses to microfinance institutions to help them better assess the credit capacity of local farmers. 
AgriWallet is a blockchain uh, decentralized technology that brings the farmers directly in contact with the, with the off takers as well as the, 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 the sellers of inputs. And it cuts, a lot, cuts out a lot of the different middlemen that eat up a lot of the margins for these farmers. So and these are all mobile, mobile technology solutions. Apollo um, is an example of, of, of a company also based in Kenya, and they use satellite imagery um, to help predict and monitor uh, farm yields and to improve using training and digital, uh, digital training on the mobile phone um, to help improve people's capacity with their yields, yield per acre. So these are the type of innovations that we see as really impactful. Um, and we have some others which we are partnering with, in, particularly in Ghana, we have some, some big solutions there um, where people are really coming up with some great ideas. Some entrepreneurs have some really great ideas um, on how to really improve the food and agri value chains using technology, because that's, that's really key for us. We see technology as the future in food and agri. Um, and if you really want to reach and maximize the capacity of all these farmers in Africa, we have so much capacity um, and it's just a lot easier to reach if you use technology. So I wanted to add a little bit of the challenges that, that we have, that we face or that our, that our partners face in Africa. So of course, we're talking about farmers. So smallholder farmers are our end, our end users, our end target group. Yeah, climatic influence. We, drought and floods, there's very little preparedness in Africa for significant weather conditions. Um, we think about a couple of months ago, there was uh, floods across uh, East Africa that really damaged a lot of crop yield, particularly rice. Rice in Rwanda really struggled because of floods. Um, also, the inefficient uh, yield per acre, so the actual output, we're not up to date with the different uh, the best practices when it comes to farming, let alone the technology, but even the best practices, there's a knowledge gap. Um, a really big one is a post harvest loss management. So in Africa, we really struggle. People can have really successful yields. You know, someone has containers and containers ready full of cocoa beans or coffee beans, but then they don't have the capacity to store it. So a lot of losses happen post harvest, which is the most um, heartbreaking if you think about it, that a lot of these farmers have worked so hard to get to the harvest stage. Um, but just because of in, you know, insufficient management of the post harvest phase, uh, warehousing, exporting, that there's a lot of wastage and there's a lot of money lost. And it it's really is one of the biggest issues. Um, and another big one, I think, which is which is which you would be very aware of is the missing middle segment. So basically the way we identify this, this is SMEs who are too big for microfinance institutions, but haven't got enough traction or track record to really attract banks. So they're in this difficult position where they really have to turn to alternative forms of financing, even after they've exhausted their family and friends and you know venture capitalists, they, there really is a limited amount of support for people in the financing segment, and those are typically the people that we like to target here at Rabo Foundation. So I thought this was also interesting to share. Um, based on where we need to be in the world um, in a couple of decades, in 2050, um, in three decades' time, the purple is where we currently are in terms of our capacity in these, in these various um, food groups, in these various uh, crops. And the yellow is where we need to be. So if you think about how, how big the growing population is in Africa, if you look, for example, at roots and tubers, you can see that the difference between the purple and the yellow is really big. Same, a bit less so with fruits and vegetables. It means that there is so much capacity for us to improve our yields, our, you know, our kilograms per hectare, because as, as it is right now, the current solutions that we have and the current farming agricultural practices we have just won't be enough to feed the populations of the future. So as an impact, as an impact financer, as an impact lender, we're really focused on trying to find ways to improve yields. Um, and so I, I saw a question there. I think I, I'll, I'll get to it towards the end. I, I, it's a fairly uh, brief uh, PowerPoint. Um, so basically now let's talk about where Rabo Foundation's role is in all of this. 
um, we really need to try and empower sustainable yield growth. So if you have a solution that um, is able to get farmers trained and aware of uh, good agricultural pro uh, practices and get people improving their yield growth, it then gets them to self-reliance. And that's our objective. You know, a lot of the, the, the partners that I mentioned earlier, that's really how critical they have been is that they're really using technology to get critical information to these farmers so they know best how to prepare themselves. Supporting the climate smart approach. So, of course, this is a very knowledge based and for a lot of farmers, they just aren't aware in Africa of what the best practices are to make sure that that their soil, for example, is going to last the longest. They don't they're not sure um, how to be more prepared uh, for, uh, you know, heavy or no rain, you know, so it's it's really a problem trying to help people, you know, be prepared for climate change because we're as a continent Africans, we are the most vulnerable. I'm, I say we because I, I'm, I'm a Ugandan. I live and work in the Netherlands, but I am a Ugandan. Uh, we're the most vulnerable because we, we, we don't have the, the capacity to react when we actually face some issues. Um, and then we also try to link value change stakeholders. So typically the way we view the continent is in different parts of the continent, we have what we call hot zones. So a hot zone in, uh, in West Africa, we think is cocoa. So we really try and focus on any solutions that will really try and help the cocoa value chain. Whereas uh, in Ethiopia, at sesame seed, uh, you know, in Kenya, they talk about dairy, coffee in Uganda. You know, there's different countries which have better specialties where we like to focus and make the most impact. And the last one is, is innovation. Um, we really believe technology is going to be the, the one route to solve these issues. And the more and more I think about, about Africa and the challenges we have, the more and more hopeful I am for technology because so much can be achieved. We've seen in Kenya what M-Pesa and the different mobile solutions have done to really um, liberate the economy. So I, I am very hopeful about this. Um, and we are really, as Rubber Foundation, dedicated to try and focus our investments into SMEs that will benefit um, the smallholder farmer on the other side. Um, that was my last slide. I left a little bit more time for questions. I think, uh, I think Thank I, you. yeah, I can open it up. Let, should I leave the screen here? Yeah. Um. So thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I think it was a really nice uh, presentation, clear. But I have yeah. some questions for you. So the first yes, one is, which bank present represents Labo Bank in Ghana? <laughs> so it's it's. It, that's not really how it works. We, we, if you were to apply, if you're based in Ghana, if you're a, a, a Ghanaian citizen and you have a, a, a project that needs to, that's a, sort of the scale up, because we don't do seed funding, so we don't, um, you know, we don't finance uh, uh, concepts, uh, but something that has a little bit of traction, we, we don't need uh, f four years or anything like that, like the formal banks do. But we need to, to have seen your idea tested in the in the real market space. But you would apply to us in the Netherlands, and if you are successful, we would um, disperse money to your Ghanaian account. So we would prefer, based on the country, that wherever you are, you're incorporated there, your business is there. Um, we seldom um, fund people abroad for a business in Africa. Usually, someone has to be based there. Thank you very much, Kevin, because the next, yes. question, the next question, of course, was about was um, if you need to register the business in the Netherlands uh, before you can access the funds. But I think it's clear now from what you said that the company uh, need to be instituted locally and then yeah. make an application in Level Foundation here and the funds will come back to Ghana and find you <laughs> or Ethiopia yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. the next. <clears throat> sorry, the next question is. Uh, what is the minimum amount given by Rabo Foundation? The minimum amount? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it 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 would really depend, but I think you, you can sort of expect to start from 50,000 euros. But that doesn't happen that often. Usually we start in the in about 200,000 region, um, all the way up to a million. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, then the next uh, question is. Uh... Oh yeah, the next one of course was if you accept precinct startup application. No, because you've already said um, you're not um, coming in uh, at the early stage. Uh, oh, that's right, Kevin. Right? Yeah, we're, we're not coming in at the really earliest stage. Um, mm -hmm. We yeah, we've supported businesses which have, which have been you know you know, working, operating for, you know, a year and a half. So that's, we, which aren't that, that, that old, but they're, they have tested their model, you know? So it's, it's, it's about, has the model been tested? We don't even have to, you don't even necessarily have to be a uh, profit making. Um, you, you can, you can still be in the much earlier part of your business. We're not as strict as a traditional bank, um, but the idea needs to have been tested. In whichever way you interpret that, um, it, it is quite flexible, um, but we, we do need a little bit of traction. Um, the other one is, um, does Labo Foundation provide grants to startups or NGOs or both? I think again. <laughs> so Labo Foundation doesn't give donations in cash, but often, um, we have given donations in kind in the sense that we do run uh, technical assistance programs um, where we have different partners um, across the continent who are specialized um, in different forms of training. So some of our partners, um, we've paid for them to receive training on business administration, um, uh, training on you know using different mobile solutions, training on um, on HR management, on management information systems, on the MIS. So we, we, our donations can come in kind in terms of training. Um, and also during this past period of COVID-19, we did have really emergency um, donations. And that was to uh, farmer cooperatives where there was a food security issue if people didn't have food. Um, but that's particularly unique to the COVID situation. As, as a normal business as usual, um, it's usually in loans, um, which range from one year to about four years, depending on the type of facility you need, working capital, or if you're CapEx, if you're buying equipment. Um, but in terms of donations, it's usually uh, in kind, never in cash. Yes. Well, um... Uh, there's another question. Um, you said you are priority agriculture products for countries such as coffee. Is Labo is Labo support that exclusive for this product in that country, or are open to agriculture products? Um, so we we're not exclusive. Um, we we our strategy is um, we think we make the most impact if we focus our expertise on one um on one value chain but of course if people have really good ideas that are going to make a big difference in another value chain we're definitely listening um and very often that does happen uh but particularly uh for example we know how strong uh cocoa is for example in ghana it makes sense if you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking of where to start with your solution to start where uh, the the most capacity most impact is uh, if you focus on I don't know potatoes in Ghana maybe that I, I wouldn't be too sure if that's not a big market but something that isn't cocoa then you will have enough challenges on its own in trying to make your business viable and then to make it uh, as impactful and as and as scalable so I would advise uh, if you haven't yet reached that point then to focus on uh, more uh, significant value chains within your own country but for sure, we're open to all value chains. Yes. Okay. Um, so how much does it cost? How, that, how, do, how much does a loan cost? Um, do you provide in local currency or euros, dollars? So we usually uh, can do in both, um, if you local currency or US dollars. The only thing would be my advice to uh, the whoever the partner is if your revenues are in local currency then take a local currency loan um if your revenues are in a foreign currency if you're planning exports or something 
then it's better to take a, a, a dollar loan. Um, but we've had some issues in the past where, you know, a country may, your business may be doing well, but if you're earning in a local currency and then your currency suffers for whatever reasons that, that can happen, that it becomes difficult to pay back a loan, even though your business is doing well. So I think it's a really important question that entrepreneurs should ask themselves is which currency should I take my loan in? Because it has a very big impact um, on your business if there is a, a foreign exchange issue. But we do both, foreign and local, uh, uh, US dollar, Euro, or uh, local currency. Oh, and the cost of the loan. Um, so it really depends. Of course, the shorter the loan, uh, the lower the interest. But we are a social lender. Um, so depending on how impactful the, 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 the project might be, you can expect anywhere between 6 and 10% um, annual interest. Uh, that was a question okay. that went by really quickly. Uh, Great. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's um, one minute over our normal time. So yes, thank I you think so it's... much, Kevin. I think it yes. was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and I'll take this opportunity to also thank everyone, all the speakers, uh, Paul, Ben, they really did something great. Um, and to all our participants, thank you for actually muting and listening and all the good questions. Um, that was really great. We will share with you the presentations and uh, contact details of um, our presenters. Um, so that they can you can follow up or you can always reach out to me um, if you need the uh, specific guidance. Um, and I think, yeah, thank you very much, Doreen. If you have anything to say, you can say thank you. <laughs> no, I think you already <laughs> thanked everyone. I can only join you in. I think the speakers were incredible again today. Yeah. So yes, we will share uh, the recordings also of this session. And I would like to encourage our listeners to join in again next week. We'll have a special edition on Ghana. Um, we don't have the agenda up yet, but we will have a speaker from Ecobank and we'll have a speaker from the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. So I really hope that you will be with us next week. And then the week after that, we'll have a special edition for Ethiopia. Yeah. So let's stay tuned, everybody, and uh, let's connect uh, even offline and um, take care and hope to see you next week. Yeah, maybe just to add one more thing, um, because the, uh, the, the webinar of next week, 24th and 1st July is country specific, Ghana and Ethiopia, please make sure you register. Otherwise, we'll be sending everyone information and we don't know who today is interested in Ghana. Of course, we have the AD4D program. Uh, guys, but uh, for the outsiders, please uh, fill in the application form so that we, we keep informed. Thank you. Yes, and the timing is a bit different next week because uh, we start, um, I think, at four, oh, four yes. Dutch time because that is three Ghana time. Yeah. Um, so, yes, we'll have the same link technologically, so I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope uh, by now you are used to uh, to logging in into webex yeah so did you, you sorry sorry did we take a picture i, I took don't... many pictures we oh, will share it on social picture. media <laughs> okay yes. so take care everyone and thank you so much yeah bye bye, bye.